Hello and welcome back to another full step by step PC build guide and today I'll be showing you how to build a PC in the Height Y60. But before we get into the PC build guide, if you do enjoy this video, please remember to hit the like button and if you're not currently subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button as well. We've just hit 50k subscribers on the channel and I'm keen to get to 100k and your subscription can make all the difference. It doesn't cost you anything but it makes a big difference to me. Okay, let's take a look at the other parts I'm going to be building with today. For the motherboard, I'm going to be using the MSI Z690 Tomahawk Wi-Fi, and I've got the DDR5 version. For the CPU, I'm going to be using Intel's 12th Gen i7, the 12700K. Keeping our CPU cool, I've got a 360mm AIO from Deepcool, it's the LS720. For RAM, I've got 32GB of Kingston Fury Beast DDR5 RGB at 5600 mega transfers per second. For storage, I'm going with a single Gen 4 NVMe M.2 SSD for this build. It's from Sabrent and it's their Rocket 4 Plus in 2TB capacity. Powering the whole build, I've got a 1200W Platinum Power Supply from BeQuiet. It's the Dark Power Pro 12. For the graphics card, I'm going to be using the ASUS ROG Strix RTX 3080. For case fans, I'm going to be using a mixture of Leon Lee's AL120 and SL140 Unifans in white. So rather than connecting up the fans using the included controller, I much prefer to connect them directly to the motherboard. So to allow me to do this for the ARGB, I've picked up Leon Lee's ARGB device cable kits. And the final part for today's build is some white cable extensions from a cable mod. Okay, that's all the parts, let's get building. So I'm gonna make a start by preparing the case. As we go, I'll point out the case's main features. So our tempered glass side panel is held on with a thumb screw at the back. We just need to unscrew that. Once the thumb screw has been removed, the panel can simply be tilted out by pushing on this little notch at the back, and then the panel can be lifted up and away. Taking a look at our other side panel, you'll notice that it is vented, so this should promote good airflow. It's removed in exactly the same way. There's a thumb screw to remove. And once the thumb screw is removed, there's a little notch in the back. You can apply some pressure. That's going to clip the panel out from the top, and it can just be lifted up and away. Taking a look at the other side of the panel that we've just removed, you'll notice that there is a built-in dust filter. To remove our front tempered glass panel, we've got three screws we need to remove from the back. And with the screws removed, we should simply be able to tilt the panel out from the top, and then lift it up and away. You'll notice that leaves us with one tempered glass panel in the middle, and to build, you don't actually need to remove this. You're going to have good access in at the side, and in at the front and importantly this panel is a structural support for the top of the case so if you remove it and put pressure in the top of the case you risk bending your frame i am going to show you how to remove it for completeness so it is held on with two screws at the top and two screws at the bottom now the screws are different sizes they're standard screws at the top um, at the bottom, it's the same type of screws you would secure an M.2 to a motherboard with so you're going to have to use a different screwdriver to remove the top and bottom screws So with the four screws removed, we can simply tilt the panel out and again lift it up and away. Take a look at the case's front I.O. We've got a power button, we've got two USB 3.0 Type-A ports, a single Type-C port and a combined headphone and microphone jack. Take a look at the top of the case, you'll notice we've got the same vented panel design. Removing it is really straightforward, we just need to apply a little bit of pressure up from the top and it will simply just pop off. And if we turn the panel over, you'll notice we've got the same built-in dust filters. Take a look at the top of the case, you'll notice we've got a fan stroke radiator bracket where you're going to be able to mount up to three 120mm fans or a 360mm radiator. We've got a little cutout here at the front which is designed for the tubes for the radiator to pass through and you'll notice the bracket is slightly offset from the top and there is enough space either to have a radiator or set of fans hidden up at the top compartment here. Um, so you're going to be able to mount, for example, your radiator in the top compartment and your fans in the main body of the case. The bracket's held on with three screws at the top and at the bottom. And with all the screws, the bracket can simply be lifted out from the top. At the bottom of the case, we've got a removable dust filter. It's held on with two little clips here. So if we push these, we're simply able to remove the dust filter. So you'll notice hidden down in the bottom compartment, we've got two 120 millimeter fans pre-included. They're secured to the bottom of the case with long radiator screws. It is possible to fit up to two 140 millimeter fans. And as I want to test out the case's maximum airflow, 
I'm going to be removing the pre-installed 120mm fans and replacing them with 140mm fans. So you'll notice the long radiator type screws that are used to secure the fans to the case. The fan cables are currently connected up to all the front I.O. cables, so I'll just free them up and then that will let me remove the fans. Okay, that's the cables freed up, so we should simply be able to remove the fans. Now importantly, you are going to want to know, the included fans have got three pin connectors on them. I'd much rather have four pin connectors that I can run in PWM mode. So again, that's another reason to remove these. Although, the, in terms of cost saving, it doesn't really make any sense to do this. I've just got loads of Lian Li Uni fans sitting on a shelf, so it makes sense to use them all for the build. So with the fans removed, you can see this bottom compartment that we have. Um, a really nice cutout here looks to be for the PCIe cables going to our graphics card. So we're going to be able to fit them through here and through here, which should help with cable management. Okay, so next thing I want to do is orientate you in the case. So we've already talked about the fans and the bottom compartment. So it's either two 120s or two 140s. And at the top of the case in the hidden compartment at the top, it's up to three 120 or two 140 millimeter fans and either a 360 or 280 millimeter radiator. On this bracket at the side, you can fit either two 120 or two 140 millimeter fans or a 240 or 280 millimeter radiator. At the rear of the case, you can fit up to a 120 millimeter fan and you'll notice height have a pre-installed one. So that's three included 120 millimeter fans for this case, one at the rear and two at the bottom. Um, if you want to go with air cooling, the maximum height for CPU air coolers is up to 160 millimeters. You'll notice that we've got this riser cable included. It is a Gen 4 riser cable and it's included because you're going to have to mount your graphics card in a vertical orientation. The horizontal slots aren't full length slots, so you're not actually going to be able to fit a graphics card here. They're designed for add-in cards, which you're going to be able to install behind the vertical graphics card where you're not actually going to be able to see them. And a really nice touch that I'd have done with the Gen 4 cable is that they've matched it in terms of colour to the main body of the case. So in terms of graphics card support, you're going to be able to fit pretty long graphics cards up to a maximum length of 375 millimetres. Taking a look at the rear of the case, you'll notice that we've got three full length vertical PCI expansion slots and seven short horizontal slots, which as I've mentioned are too short to install your graphics card and designed really for add-in cards. Before we're able to fit our motherboard in the case, we're going to have to free up our riser cable. So we're going to have to remove this top horizontal screw. With the screw removed, you'll notice we're able to slide the riser cable down and out of the way, which is going to make space for us to install our motherboard. So I'm also planning on removing the rear fan and replacing it with the Lian Li Uni fan because this one doesn't have any RGB on it. So it's held on with four screws. So you'll notice in the rear of the case, we've got two drive trays. They're each held on with two thumb screws. So we loosen up the captive thumb screws at the back. We're going to be able to slide the drive trays out from the back. Now, into each of these drive trays, you're going to be able to fit one three and a half inch drive or two two and a half inch drives. If we remove our second drive tray, you'll notice it contains our case accessory box. I'll show you what's in it in a minute. So our instruction manual, which seems to be of good quality, is included in the main box of the case. And this is everything that comes in the case accessory box. So it's absolutely brilliant to see that our screws are not only individually packaged, but it says on the bag what each of them are for. So we've got 22 pieces here for the motherboard and SSDs. We've got nine pieces here for hard drives and five pieces here for securing our power supply. So normally when I do this video, I go through the screws and show you which screw to use where but I don't need to do here because you just need to take it out of the bag and use it for its label purpose. So other case manufacturers should take note and do this. We've got absolutely loads of cable ties. An important check, we've got the standoff removal and insertion tools. So a lot of manufacturers will try and cut corners here by not including this. Um, so it's great to see that it's included even in the case where you're almost certainly going to install a full-sized ATX motherboard. So you could argue it's not really needed. And then we've got an audio splitter cable. So taking a look in the rear compartment, you can see the two drive trays here. Our power supply is going to go in here, and um, we've got a little mounting reel for it. And power supply is up to a maximum length of 235 millimeters are supported. 
And you can see we're going to have plenty of space under here and over to the side of the power supply for our cables. So even though I've gone with an absolutely massive power supply, cable management should hopefully be fairly straightforward. We've got some rubber grommets on the two main cutouts to the main compartment of the case, which look pretty good as well. We're going to do as much work in the motherboard as we can and we've got it on the table. So we're going to install our CPU, the bracket for our CPU cooler, our M.2 SSD and our RAM all before we insert the motherboard into the case. So to open the socket to install our CPU, we need to push this lever down, out and all the way to the top, and then we could open the socket cover. We can set our CPU down into the socket, lining it up with the notches at the top and at the bottom. And once we're happy the CPU is in the socket, the text is up the correct way, we can close the cover over again. If we put a little bit of pressure here, the black bit of plastic will pop off. We'll put that into our motherboard box, and then we can secure our CPU by closing the lever again. We're now ready to install our M.2 SSD, and this motherboard has four M.2 SSD drive slots. In general, it's the top slot that tends to give you the fastest speed, and as we've only got one drive, it makes sense to install it here. So the first thing to do is remove the heatsink, which is held on with two screws. To install our drive, we just need to insert it into the slot at a slight angle, and then flatten it down. You'll notice we've got this clip here to secure our drive into place, so all we need to do is push the lever down, and you'll notice the little bit of plastic comes over the drive, holding it in place. Before we replace the heatsink, you'll notice we've got some plastic protection on the back that we need to remove. Next thing to do is install our RAM. Because we've only got two stacks of RAM, we're going to need to install it in the second and fourth slot along from the CPU. So we can open the clips on both sides of those RAM slots. Then we need to line the RAM up with the slot. Once we're happy, we've got everything lined up. It's just some firm pressure to the RAM and it's going to clip into place. And then the same thing with our second stick. Line it up with a slot and some firm pressure to clip it into place. Next, we can insert the back plate for our CPU cooler. You're going to want to make sure each of the screws are pulled to the outer setting. And then it's just a matter of lining the bracket up with the back of the motherboard. Then on the other side, we can put one of these spacers onto each corner. Next, we can set the motherboard into the case, lining it up with the standoffs. Now, the middle standoff does protrude slightly, so it will hold the motherboard in place. Then we can secure the motherboard into place using the label screws from the accessory box. Okay, next thing to do is get our case cables plugged in. So our HD audio cable is going to go into this header down the bottom left-hand side of the motherboard. So we'll bring the cable through the cutouts at the bottom, and we're going to have to plug it in with the HD audio text facing up the way. Down at the bottom right-hand side, the second header in is for our front panel connectors. And thankfully, Heist have combined these all into a single plug. Again, you'll notice there's a pin missing on the header and also a hole missing on the cable. So we're going to need to plug this in with the front panel connector label facing up the way. And then I can pull the excess cable through to the back. Our USB 3.0 header is going to go here. So we'll bring our cable through the cutout. Now you'll notice on the cable there is a little notch and there's also a little notch on the header so we're going to have to line these up the correct way around and then push into place. Just below that we've got our Type-C cable so again we'll bring it through the cutout, line it up with the header and push into place. And again pull the excess cable through to the back. We are now ready to install our power supply and although this is a fully modular power supply meaning it comes without any of the cables plugged in, I've gone ahead and plugged the cables in that we're going to need. So I plugged in a 24 pin cable, we've got two 8 pin EPS cables, we've got three 6 plus 2 pin PCIe cables, which is what our graphics card is going to need. And I've also plugged in a SATA cable, which our IO is going to need. You'll also notice I plugged in white cable extensions for our 24 pin cables and our PCIe cables. I haven't plugged white cable extensions in for EPS cables because I think once we've got the radiator installed at the top, we're not actually going to see them. So an important point, this is our power supply's intake fan. We've got a vented panel on the back, so we're going to want to install it with the intake fan facing out the way. So we can set the power supply into the case. We can then use four of the screws from the accessory box labelled power supply to secure the power supply into place. Next thing to do is get our power supply cables plugged in. Our two 8-pin EPS cables are going to go into here at the top left-hand side of the motherboard. So we'll bring them through the cutout at the top, line them up with the headers and push into place. And then we'll just pull it, the excess cable through to the back. 
Next, I want to get our 24-pin cable plugged in. It's going to go into this header here. So we'll bring the cable through the cutout, line it up with the header, and push into place. And then you'll notice we've got some cable combs in the cable extension that we can use to help tidy up the cables. We're now ready to start work on our I.O. And rather than using the fans that came with the I.O., I'm going to use the Lee and Lee Uni fans. The reason for this is I'm going to have the radiator at the top set to intake, which is quite an unusual configuration to have. But on looking at the layout in the case, I think it's actually going to give us the best temperatures and the best looks overall. And that's largely because of the orientation I want to have the side fans in, which I'll come on to explain later on. And the big advantage of these Lee and Lee Uni fans, this is them the wrong way round set to intake. They actually look really, really good. This is the front of them, this is the back. So these are going to be the sides showing in the case and they're going to match all the other fans. The fans that come with the I.O. look great on the correct way round, having it set to exhaust at the top. But when you set it to intake at the top, they're not going to look particularly great. Um, if you do want to see how to install this I.O. with the original fans, check out my Fractal Focus 2 build guide where I've installed this I.O. with the original fans. So the first thing for us to do is connect the three Lee and Lee Uni fans together and they just simply clip into place and slide them this way and here and here. So that's the three of them connected up. Next, we need to put one of the connectors onto the end and it simply slips in here and then pushes into place. Now, before we put the fans on the radiator, we're gonna to have to install the top bracket in between the fans and the radiator. So we set the bracket into place Make sure the holes in the bracket line up with the screw holes in the radiator and then we can set the fans on top. Then we're going to want to use the long radiator screws to secure the fans through the bracket to the radiator. Next thing I want to do is talk you through all the cables. So coming from our group of Lee and Lee Uni fans, we've got two cables. One is a standard four pin PWM connector, and that's gonna go into our CPU fan header. The other is the connector for ARGB, and the triple packet Lee and Lee Uni fans come with an ARGB hub, which you'll connect with a USB cable to your motherboard and use Lee and Lee's L-Connect software to get lots of great effects on the fans. I only want to set them to white, so there is an easier way to connect them up, but it does require an additional cable. So this is the additional cable that I talked about at the start, which came in Lee and Lee's ARGB device cable kit. So coming from the cable, we've got two connectors where a group of Lee and Lee Uni fans can plug into. So we'll plug it in. We're gonna have space for another Lee and Lee Uni fan to go there. And then we've got a standard three pin five volt ARGB connector on the other end, which is simply gonna go into our motherboard and use our motherboard software to control the lighting. Coming from our pump, we've got two cables. One is a standard three pin fan cable, which is gonna go into our pump header on the motherboard to power the pump and allow us to control the speed using the motherboard bias. Our other cable is for the ARGB, um, and there's a cable that comes with the IO that we need to plug it into. So coming from the end of this, we've got a multitude of connectors. There's actually only two that we're going to have to worry about because we're using separate fans. If you want to see again how to set up the I.O. with the original fans, I've made a separate video on it, and I'll put a link to that video in the description. So the only two cables we're going to have to plug in is this 3-pin 5-volt ARGB cable and the SATA power cable. We can ignore the other cables. So next we can lower our I.O. into the case from the top. And then we can secure the bracket at the top with the original six screws. Next, we can add some thermal paste to the center of the CPU. We can then lower our CPU cooler down into place, lining it up with the back plate beneath. And then we've got a thumb screw to go on each corner. Next, we can pass the ARGB cable coming from the pump through to the back. And then gonna bring the ARGB cable back through and plug it into a header here at the top of the motherboard. Just to the left of the ARGB cable, we've got our CPU pump header. So we'll bring the three pin cable coming from the pump and get it plugged in. And then just tuck the excess cable through to the back. Next to the pump header, we've got our CPU fan header. So the cable coming from our Lee and Lee Uni fans, I'm gonna plug into it. 
and then pull the excess cable through to the back. And then the other cable coming from our lane, the Unifans is for ARGB. We're just gonna push it through to the back. And then if we bring the cable through the bottom, down at the bottom, we've got two ARGB headers, so we'll get plugged in to one of these. And we're gonna need another one of these cables to get all our case fans plugged in. So we've got another ARGB header just next to that, so I'll get it plugged into here. And then we'll push the other end of the cable through to the back. And we'll plug in our case fans to it whenever we get to that point. And then we just need to plug the SATA cable coming from our AIO into the SATA cable coming from our power supply. So the next thing I want to do is install our case fans, but before I do, I want to explain the reason I'm installing the fans in their current orientation, because the radiator at the top set to intake is quite an unusual orientation. So you can fit either 2120 or 2140, and as I've mentioned, the AL Uni fans would look great on the side as intake. And this would be the straightforward orientation that you would want to go for. You would intake at the side, intake at the bottom, and exhaust at the top and exhaust at the back. The problem is I don't think having two 120 fans looks great on the side. There's a lot of space above and at the side and at the bottom, and I think two 140s looks much better. So we set the two 140s in. I think you'll agree that looks much better. Now, unfortunately, at the moment, you can't get the AL120 Uni fans in 140mm size. And these SL120 Uni fans look absolutely terrible set to intake. So that's the reason I've gone with this particular orientation. I'm going to put two 140s on the side set to exhaust, exhaust at the rear, intake at the top, intake at the bottom. And I actually think as well as looking the best, this is actually going to give us the best temperatures but I will test this at the end. So I've just added the cable onto these two SL140 Uni fans. I'm gonna pass the cable through to the back, and then we'll set the fans on here at the bottom and get them screwed in from the back. I'm gonna set an SL120 Uni fan in at the rear, set to exhaust. And then I'm gonna pass the RGB cable through to the back. Now, unfortunately, the cable coming from the fan is too short to root all the way around the back into one of the fan headers at the bottom of the motherboard. But we do have a fan header just to the left of the first M.2 slot. So I'm gonna get it plugged into here. And then what I'm gonna do is just tuck the excess cable in behind the fan and root it through to the back. At the bottom of the case, we can add two SL140 Uni fans set to intake. And then we're going to use the long radiator screws that came with the case to secure the fans to the case. We can then pass the fan cables through to the back. And then replace the bottom dust filter. Okay, next thing to do is get our outstanding ARGB and PWM cables plugged in. So we'll start off with the ARGB cables. The bottom fan, I'm not going to plug the ARGB in because I do want the bottom fan to light up. We've got our side fan, so I'm going to take the ARGB cable and plug it into one of the spur headers we have down at the bottom, coming from the two cables going to the ARGB header. We've also got the cable from our rear fan here, so I'm going to plug it into one of the other spur headers. Okay, next thing to do is plug in our outstanding PWM cables. We've already plugged in the PWM cable for the rear fan and the top fans, so it's just the side fans and the bottom fans. So I'm going to pass those through to the main body of the case. And then down at the bottom and next to the two ARGB headers, we've got two fan headers, so we'll get the cables plugged into here. And then we'll pull the excess cable through to the back. So now that we've got all our cables plugged in down at the bottom of the motherboard, we should be able to plug our riser cable into the motherboard. So we can open the slot on the motherboard. We can remove the protective covering from the riser cable. But one of the things I'm noting is the slot on the motherboard actually lines up with the second PCIe slot. So I'm just gonna remove the slot cover. And then I'm gonna take this slot cover and move it up to the top slot and put it back into place. We can then line our riser cable up with the slot. Once we're happy everything's lined up, we can apply some firm pressure to it. And it's going to clip into place. And then we can just secure the riser card into place with the screw we removed at the start. 
To install our graphics card, we're going to need to remove the first and second vertical slot cover closest to the motherboard. So just before we install our graphics card, I did note this cutout at the bottom, which I assume is for our PCIe power cables going to our graphics card. I didn't pass them through before installing the fans, and it looks like I'm not going to be able to do it without removing the fans. Um, I think there's probably just enough space that they will fit without putting pressure on the fans themselves. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to remove the fans, pass the cable, and then put the fans back into place. So that's our PCIe cable extensions brought through this cutout, and it does look like that they should fit without the fans getting in the way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to install the graphics card, plug these in, because then I'm going to be able to get them to the right length, and then replace the bottom fans. So next thing to do is get our graphics card in. So we'll open the slot on our riser cable. We can then line the GPU up with the slot. And once we're happy, everything's lined up. We can apply some firm pressure to the graphics card. It's going to clip into place and the slot is going to close. Then we can secure the graphics card into place with the two screws we removed earlier on. Next, we can get our PCIe cables plugged into the graphics card. And then we'll use the cable combs to help organize the cable. So I think what I'm going to do is bring our I.O. cables through the PCIe power cable, so we'll just unplug them again. We can then set our bottom fans back into place, and we'll get them screwed in. And you'll notice now our bottom fans are able to spin without any problems with the cables at the bottom. And then we'll just replace the bottom dust filter. Okay, last thing to do is some cable management, but it looks like we've got absolutely loads of space, plenty of cable ties included, so hopefully it's a fairly straightforward process. So that's the build complete and I'm absolutely delighted with how it turned out. Building in this case was really, really straightforward and we've got an absolutely stunning build in my usual black and white colour scheme. You'll notice I've gone ahead and set the PC up. The reason I've done that is if you want to know how to set up an MSI motherboard, um, you can check out my Lanco 3 build guide. It's all the same and I don't want to make this video any longer than what it needs to be. And that's why I've gone ahead and set it up off camera. So if you need to know how to install Windows, the drivers, get the RGB software up and running, check out that video and you'll find a link to it in the description. So the PC looks great, but what about the temperatures? So our CPU idled at 31 degrees and reached a maximum at 85 degrees during a 10 minute idle 64 stability test. Our GPU idled at 38 degrees, reaching a maximum of 76 degrees during the stability test. In terms of noise levels, we had an average noise level of 31 decibels at idle and 50 decibels under load. So the next thing I wanted to test was see what happened if we flipped the fans around on the radiator. So the radiator top was now set to exhaust and the fans on the side were set to intake. So as expected, changing the I.O. from intake to exhaust resulted in our CPU temperatures going up by 3 degrees at idle and 8 degrees under load. Our GPU temperatures did however come down by 4 degrees at idle and 7 degrees under load. In terms of noise levels, there was no difference at idle and 1 decibel less noise under load. The other thing we need to factor in is the aesthetics and the 140mm fans on the side just don't look as good set to intake. What you could do is the silver medallions in the front of the fan, you can remove them with a heat gun and stick them to the back and that would look better. Or whenever Lian Lee released their AL140 fans, putting them on the side is going to look absolutely amazing. 
and that will solve all the issues. So if I had to choose between the two different configurations, the one I put together in the build guide with the IO at the top set to intake, or the one I've got now with the IO set to exhaust, I would probably go with this one here with it set to exhaust and the fans on the side set to intake. Um, with the configuration in the build guide, I didn't get quite as big a saving in the CPU temperatures as what I thought I was going to get, and the GPU went up significantly higher than what I would be happy with. The other thing to remember is the Ida64 stability test is a really extreme stress of the CPU, and it will run much hotter during that than what it will when you're gaming. GPU temperatures are about the same in terms of gaming and Ida64 stability test. So overall, that configuration with the intake on the side and the AI with the top set to exhaust would give overall better temperatures. So what I want to do now is share my thoughts on having built in the Height Y60. And this is an incredibly easy case to build in. There's lots of space, um, it's really well thought out and well designed, and the build quality is excellent. And as you can see, we've come up with a really stunning build. Really, the only downside for me is the thermals. And the GPU is running significantly hotter than what I would like it to, and I think that's because it's up against the front temper glass panel. And this Strix card is a really good card, and I think that's the reason why the GPU temperatures haven't jumped up so much. But it just doesn't seem to get a lot of airflow from the fans underneath, and whenever we added the additional airflow in at the side, it seemed to manage to cool it. So the case does seem a little bit restrictive, and again, with a 360mm AIO at the top set to intake, I wasn't getting as low CPU temperatures as what I would have liked. Um, so again, in terms of thermals, they're not the best for this case, but I don't really think that's what this case is about. It's a showcase, it's designed to look great, and it certainly does that. So I've really enjoyed building in this case. I'm delighted with the build that has been put together, and if you like it, I certainly could recommend it even though the thermals aren't excellent. So hopefully you have enjoyed this video. If you have, please remember to give it a thumbs up. And if you're not currently subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button as well. Thanks for watching.